Thank you, ladies, and may we find real treasure in each other, which is in essence what that offering was about. The blessings of life, the privilege of love and togetherness. Let's pray. Father, we are on the cusp of a new year, and I pray that the decisions we make now would be decisions that would shape this year for your glory, for the well-being and the functionality of our lives. We put ourselves in your hands now, praying that the Holy Spirit would direct and that we would be sensitive to your impress. May this truly be a holy interaction with your word. We surrendered, you present, you teaching, and we follow in your lead. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 51. I want to couch the presentation this morning in a concern, and the concern was a legitimate one, and the privilege, and the privilege was a legitimate one. This is the uh, Roman account, Mark's account of Jesus' last journey out of Jericho to Jerusalem, and of course, he met a man who would not be ignored. His name was Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus Here's a stir in the crowd, wants to know what's going on, and he asks who it is. When he finds out it's Jesus, he stands up and starts crying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They tell him to be quiet. It's like pouring gas on a fire. He gets louder, and Jesus says, I want to talk to him. It's a one-on-one audience with Jesus, although there's a larger listening group And Jesus asked him a question. He says in verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Now, that's a beautiful question. But there may be times when you don't want to tell everybody who's listening what it is that you want done. Take your Bibles and turn back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, I want to lay the groundwork for where we are geographically. In Matthew chapter 4, We hear in verse 12 and 13 about the migration of Jesus from a man of Nazareth to a man of Capernaum. It says in verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Turn over to chapter 9. Chapter 9 is where the narrative begins in the book of Matthew that we're going to focus on today. And I just want us to get a picture in the the flow of history with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, it says, Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea, and he came to his own city. Now, just before this, Uh, Jesus has healed the demoniacs of Gergesa, and he has quieted the storm on the lake. Now, I'm not going to focus in Matthew's account, even though it's the longest book. I'm going to focus in Mark's. Now, this story is in Matthew 9, which we're leaving, and we're moving over to Mark 5 because Mark tells us more of the details. So go to Mark 5. There's been about a five or six mile boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. They've gone from the east side where it's kind of wild and the pigs were hurting and the demons were cast out of legion. And now we've gone on a northwest journey across the Sea of Galilee and we find ourselves in Capernaum, Jesus' town. And when he gets there, he's an instant sensation. The masses have not turned away from him yet. And two things happen almost simultaneously which seem to create a problem. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 5, verse 21, it says, When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and upon seeing him fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter's at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing on him. 
A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped by all, but rather grew worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I'll get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body she was healed of her affliction. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power proceeded from him and had gone forth, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to a daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue officials saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? I started with Bartimaeus's question or the question given to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do? And this may be the impetus behind a woman being very secretive and very careful, not really wanting an encounter with Jesus, a verbal dynamic dialogue, because explaining what she wanted him to do in front of all these people might be the last thing she wanted to do. I want to leave with three words in your mind when you walk out of this sanctuary today from this story that shape your 2019 experience. It's been 18 years since many people sat around with the, their, their newly purchased generators waiting to see if the world would come to an end. And here we are almost a fifth of the way through a new century. And the, the years are rolling by because the days and months are rolling by. And what I want to do is I want at the beginning of 2019, I want you to go away with three words and think and pray about what these three words mean to you in this new year. The first word is intentional. When we look at this story, we see four very intentional living beings or persons. The first intentional person that I want us to understand that we're looking at is a man. He's a man who's associated with the synagogue. He has significance. He's religious. He has influence. Perhaps this is why he can break through the crowd and get Jesus' attention. This man is intentional because his heart is walking around on the outside in the form of a 12-year-old girl. Mark doesn't tell us she's 12 years old. Luke tells us this. For 12 years, one woman in the story has been sick trying to get better. And for 12 years, one man's heart has been bonding deeply with a little baby he held in his arms and now his dear sweet one who's slipping away. If there's intentionality in this story, it's certainly in the life of Jairus because it doesn't matter to him how many people he bumps into and probably has an entourage making away. He will see Jesus. The second intentional person in this story is obviously the woman with the flow of blood. She's had trouble for a long time. The Bible tells us that she's had three major parts of her life rearranged, her physical well-being, her financial well-being, and her social well-being. She's afflicted with some type of disease of which we know not what it is, but it is limiting her relatability in social spiritual settings. She's exceptionally intentional. She is looking for a moment to encounter Jesus, but it would be better if it worked out like it did, or at least partway like it did, because touching his cloak and slipping away would be a whole lot less embarrassing than telling her whole story. One commentator says her malady was especially afflicting, for not only did it unfit her for all the relationships of life, but it was popularly regarded as the direct consequence of sinful habit. Now the third person or being that I want you to see as intentional in this story is Satan himself. He has thronged Jesus. The word in the book of Luke is choked Jesus with the crowds. The devil has an exceptionally focused purpose in life and in this case he would like to frustrate both people's interest. The woman who has a flow of blood for 12 years and the man who has a 12-year-old daughter. He wants neither of their requests to be granted, and so what does he do? He piles the circumstances full of people 
In this case, he makes it almost impossible that either are going to get what they want. Now, we know that the story has a big interruption in it, which I don't want to get to quite yet, and that there's a pause long enough for the woman, probably middle-aged, probably not elderly, this middle-aged woman, maybe even young, we don't know, but there is a long enough pause for her to tell her story. I highly doubt that that pause is the substantive reason why Jesus wouldn't make it on time to see Jairus' daughter. But there is at least three intentional individuals in this story. Jairus, the woman, and Satan. Now, trouble tends to bring our lives into focus. We don't like it. It's not something that we have to have to come into focus, which is why my first word for you this morning is intentional. I want to know how intentional, God wants to know how intentional you are about what things ought to be evaluated and what things ought to be changed in your life as you point forward. Some of the decisions you make right now are going to change the direction you go farther down the road. If anybody should be intentional, since we know there's an end game and there's a meeting of Jesus, it ought to be us. We ought to say in our lives, this matters, this doesn't. This is an opportunity, but this privilege or responsibility is more important. But the most intentional person in this story is undoubtedly Jesus. Jesus has a plan, and in Jesus' plan, there is the ability to heal Jairus' daughter, and there's time enough to talk with a woman who's been suffering for a long time with the wrong ideas about his father. Jesus is the big interruption in this. It's not so much that the woman touches his clothes, is that Jesus stops everybody to have an interrogation and then a dialogue about it. Jesus is not stuck, though, because the only instrument in Jesus' tools box is not chronological. It's not that he has to be to Jairus' house in the time frame that Jairus thinks. Being just on time or just in time in Jairus' mind is different than that is in Jesus' mind. What's out of bounds for me and for you is not out of bounds for Jesus. He has a thousand ways to heal every disease or fix every problem that we don't know anything about. Jesus is man, but he is also God. And in this story, we see four very intentional people. Now, the crowd has some measure of intentionality, but none of their intention can be equal to these four individuals. Now, I'm here to tell you today, Satan wants to choke your life with so much opportunity and so many commitments in the wrong places that you won't be available for the divine encounters that'll change your life. Intentionality is something that we have the privilege of having. You have freedom over most of the elements of your life. You have the power to choose. You're not living in an oppressive society. I had a very good encounter in between the services or at the beginning of this service. I don't know exactly what time it was at. I ran into a woman in the foyer looking at the bulletin board. I made a new friend, became better acquainted with a new sister in the Lord. I learned their names. I met their family. I found out about their journey. And they said something that they couldn't know was very similar to something I had just been thinking about as I was reflecting on this message. As one of them is pursuing a college goal, the other one is waiting. Why? Because there's two little beautiful children in this family who need, in this case, the divine intentional touch of the one who brought them into this world. Their mother will be the one that is guiding them. Now, now everybody may not be in a position where this is possible, but with intentionality, it's more possible than you might think. I think about my studies, my own pursuit of higher education, how I put it off once, I put it off twice, had permission both times, I put it off a third time, I even bought my books, but there was something very intentional about my life. My children were in a phase of life where I knew they very much needed an available father. That intentionality has shaped my life. It put off a goal that I had farther than I thought I might want to put it off. But I want to tell you today, in the middle of my waning years as a parent, I don't have the first regret. 
I'm a free-thinking individual guided by the inspiration of this book and the spirit of prophecy and a living, guiding shepherd, Jesus, who is intentional about bringing my life into focus and a picture of his Father into focus through my ministry, and I'm following him. Intentionality. How intentional are you? Are you bouncing through life like a ping-pong ball? based on inconsequential and unintentional dynamics, many of which are strategized, engineered for you through the devices that are around you. It was only three months ago that we had our iChristian weekend and we listened to software engineers and social, social media experts tell us that these devices are intentionally engineered to engage you and not make you the master of your life, but make you a functionary of the stimuli around you. How intentional are you? Some of you may need to say, I will only be on this so long. I got a new one recently, by the way. It's a new old one. It was brand new. It's just about four or five models older than the ones that a lot of you have. And it's okay if you have one. This just happened to fit my priority systems, my my budget, etc. But on this one, I get a little weekly reminder of how long I've been on it every day. It's okay, I don't really need it because I use it primarily for what I need, not for what they want me to use it for. Intentionality. Jesus is the most intentional person in this narrative. He stops the show. He asks, who touched me? And everybody's incredulous except one anonymous person in the group. She knows what he's talking about. This is an amazing story. Amidst the the press of the throng and the push of the masses, Jesus can distinguish between a person who really connects with him and one who doesn't. You may be surrounded by Seventh-day Adventists or surrounded by other Christians. That doesn't mean they're connecting with Jesus and you can't just march along with the herd and think everything's going to be all right. There is a purposefulness, a prioritization of our choices in our living. Jesus is the shepherd of our life. He's the giver of our gifts, and he's the architect of our future. And as we go forward, we've got to let his intentionality be the intentionality of our lives. Otherwise, we're a functionary of Satan. Oh, yes. Hundreds of people, maybe thousands, walking along the seashore. There's at least four people there who have a purpose. And that purpose is, one is to thwart the ministry of Jesus, two are to find and experience the ministry of Jesus, and Christ himself is there to have a living encounter with one of them. The second word I want to put in your mind as you anticipate 2019 is the word social. You might say relational. Why does this matter? Because in the Western world, especially in America, we are so individualistic that we're focused on what we need or what we want. And beyond that, well, it's just everybody else is for themselves. I want you to understand that this encounter was prematurely made social by Jesus. She could have come up to the back of him. She could have touched the hem of his garment. It could have been provisional without being social. She, should have got, she could have gotten what she wanted and called that the end of the story. But Jesus says, no, no, no. It's interesting. He stops the crowd. He says, who touched me? Peter looks at him and says, are you joking? But the spirit of prophecy says that looking toward the woman, all right, imagine this, you know. The Bible's very clear in verses 28 and 29, or 29 and 30. Immediately the flow of blood stopped. Immediately Jesus' new power had gone out of it. And so can you imagine being in the crowd somehow? There's a little spot that's opened up around Jesus. And he's looking right at you. And he knows what happened. And you know what happened. And he wants to know who touched him. Jesus insisted. Ellen White says, upon knowing who had touched him. And finding concealment vain, she came forward trembling and knelt at his feet. And a couple things happened. Number one, he calls her daughter, which if she thought she was exiled through some kind of poor choice, this is a reinstatement of her royal position in the family of God. He affirms her faith, which is, makes her touch different. Instead of being angered, Ellen White writes, 
at her presumption, Jesus commended her for her action. Woman, daughter, it's your faith. Jesus wasn't going to leave this as a superstitious encounter where he's got the power and all we've got to do is touch his clothes. This will happen later in the gospel. It's recorded and also in the book of Acts. But at the end of the day, Jesus is going to make this a very social moment. Now, he has an encounter with the woman and the woman has an encounter with God. The Bible tells us in verse 33, she told him the whole truth. She tells her story. I'm not going to say every absolute little bitty embarrassing part, but most of the embarrassing parts. She confesses her faith. Spirit of Prophecy says, in the hearing of all the multitude, she told Jesus the simple story of her long and tedious suffering and the instant relief that she had experienced in touching the border of her garment. Her narration was interrupted by her grateful tears of joy and of perfect health. What a testimony meeting, which had been a stranger to her for 12 years. Yes, social is the word I want to put on your 2019 top three words of the year. I don't know what they'll pick as a word of the year for the nation and the world, but I I know the three words that I think Jesus wants to be ours. Intentional. I'm making decisions. I'm evaluating where I've been. I've thought about where I'm going. Is this what I want? Has the devil crowded my life up with things that are okay, but aren't good when it comes to thinking about what God's saying and what my priority system is. Social. Jesus has a social encounter. He wants emotional connection with this woman. He wants spiritual intimacy. He doesn't just want to let her pick what she wants off the shelf as a Christmas present and walk away stroking it saying, wonderful, wonderful. She wants, he wants a connection with her. And he also wants her to have a connection with him. But then I want to go to two levels in this story that we don't often think about. There is a social dynamic between the woman and the crowd. Oh, yes. Your Christian journey is not just about you and Jesus. What God has done for you is for other people, too. Jesus wants her to tell the story, the uncomfortable story. He actually requires her to tell it. And if you had just a moment to reflect on it, think about how uncomfortable that would have to be. Now, I know we're living in a society where you can barely drive down the road without seeing things that you you need to make a covenant with your eyes not to look at. I know we're living in the age of the liberated discussion where nothing's taboo and nothing's sacred. And you can talk about sexuality and intimate dynamics of people's lives as if it was just like talking about tennis. But this is not how it's always been. And while there's some benefit to being able to discuss some things a little more openly, there is also some detriment. And in the age in which Jesus is dialoguing, this woman is having to talk about things that probably only her husband, if she had one or has one, would know about and maybe her family members. She's telling things that might have some looking askance at her, looking down their nose at her. Jesus doesn't leave it there. How easy is it today for us to be anti-social? How rigorous are our social motivations and skills? I'd like to suggest to you that even modern secular social science could validate the fact that we seem to have less and less interest in each other and more and more interest in our own stimulating opportunities. So I'm more comfortable being in a crowd, connecting with you. I mean, it's a strange thing to me. There's a certain generation, they don't want you to call them. Don't call. And mind you, I like a good text. Texts are fast and simple and I can squeeze them in in a meeting. I I might be able to notice it. I might go hours before I even notice I've gotten it. But uh, there is a new social dynamic, and that is, uh, don't call me, just text me. Now, mind you, I'm not against texting. I actually love it. If you listen to my voicemail on my phone, it'll tell you. If you really want to get a hold of me, 
shoot me a text because I'll see it faster. And by the time I get to a voicemail, the problem may be fixed or the issue may be handled. But you know what? There is a fair amount of social laziness that has built into our society. And it used to be that one of the great dynamics of entertainment and engagement was actually face-to-face, person-to-person, in-your-presence dialogue. Now, we've come to the place where, like religious consumers, we pick and choose. Oh, that's for that generation, or that's an old-timers thing, or... And while there are some things that are dedicated to certain people groups, subgroups in our church without a problem, there is a whole host of things and certainly our main spiritual services that are for everybody. And I want to ask you a question. How did this woman have an idea that she could get healed by touching Jesus' clothes? Where did she get this idea? We're pretty early in the story of Jesus. Nobody else has had this happen to him yet. Where did she get this idea? Where did she get the idea that Jesus would even heal her? Where did she get the idea that it would be okay for him to be touched by her? I'll tell you where she got the idea. This is not a bombshell. She heard it from somebody else. And you know, We are benefited. There's a social encounter between us and this woman, though she's long since deceased, because Jesus required her to have a social encounter with him. She was blessed. The crowds were blessed. And we are blessed. We know what happened to her. She could have slipped in and slipped away, and it was all a done deal, and nobody would be any the wiser for her interaction, except Jesus said, no, this is not just to be provisional. This is to be social. I want a connection with you. The crowd deserves to hear what you've done and we're listening and reading and I'm preaching today about this story because of the social dynamic. Now, I want to ask you, how is your sociability in the family of God? Do you just slip in for this and slip out for that? Would it be better if you never sat at a potluck, never were in a small group, never were in a prayer meeting? Does it fit your busy, crowded schedule? Think intentional, our first word to just stay at home and tuck your little sound bites in. I'm all for for the prepackaged devotionals you can get from our supporting ministries. Listen to them all you can, but nothing is going to replace the flesh and blood, breathing, living, visible encounter you share with somebody else in proximity to them. We need to come together. Social is the second word. Jesus could have easily given her what she wanted. Jesus was in the crowd. She could not get close to Jesus, so Jesus got close to her. Read the spirit of prophecy. Makes it clear. Jesus made the way for this woman to have this encounter. And then Jesus required this woman to say out loud what it was that had been wrong, what it was that was made right, and that his affirmation was upon her. We should all be witnesses for Jesus, Ellen White writes in Adventist Home, page 428. Satan doesn't want this to happen, my interjection. So he's making it to where we don't even want to be with each other, don't want to talk with each other. Social laziness is a plague. You need to teach your children how to be intentional. You need to teach your children to shake a hand, to look in somebody else's face to be gracious. You need to model to your family that we don't go to potluck so we can eat. We go to potluck so we can minister. We don't go to prayer meeting just so we can get a blessing. We go to prayer meeting so that we can minister. I am a social being. This fabric of our togetherness is one of our greatest witnesses. Social power, she'll go on to say, sanctified by the grace of Christ, must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we're not selfishly absorbed in our own interest but that we desire others to share our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he ministered for the benefit of men. Also writing in the ministry of healing, she says, it's through the social relations that Christianity comes in contact with the world. Now, that seems like a simple enough thing. First base to ministering and to witnessing is contact. Of course, that can happen electronically, but that's a step removed from the full gamut of impressions that can be left in person. You work with people. You go to school with people. You eat with people. You should be worshiping and encouraging and witnessing amongst these same 
people. Every man or woman who has received the divine illumination is to shed light on the dark pathway of those who are unacquainted with the better way. This woman with the flow of blood, legion, that's what Jesus was doing. Social power, sanctified by the Spirit of Christ, must be improved in bringing souls to the Savior. Going on, she writes, Christ is not to be hid away in the heart as a coveted treasure, sacred and sweet, to be enjoyed solely by the professor. We're to have Christ in us as a well of water, springing up to everlasting life, refreshing all who come in contact with us. One more from Adventist Home. The converts to the gospel were one of heart and soul. One common interest controlled them, the success of the mission entrusted to them. Their love for the brethren and the cause they espoused was greater than their love of money and possessions. Their work testified that they accounted souls of men of higher value. And then 1 John 3, 16, we won't look it up, but I want to state it here. It says, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now listen, if you were ever talking to a non-social person 30 years ago, you're listening to him right now. I can remember in my first district coming home and talking with my wife. We were talking about visitation and I said, who would want to visit with me? Slowly over the years and more rapidly in some situations than other, it became clear to me how many lonely, questioning, doubting, hurt, Insecure people there are in the world, of which I am one. I want to remind you that everybody is insecure until they're made secure. This is what healthy families do. This is what healthy church families do for each other. Every advantage you have as a family, every advantage you have as an individual, makes you a debtor to those who don't have those blessings. But if you hang out at home and feel your life so full of all the wonderful opportunities that your money, your education, and your social position gives you, you might be missing out on following the Savior into that social encounter where you're supposed to give something away. In other words, what is one of the witnesses of the 21st century going to be from the Christians? Yes, I've got money. Yes, I've got education. Yes, I've got opportunity. Yes, I've got networking. But you know what? I'm not taking advantage of all my opportunities. I'm dedicating my life to reach the world for Christ. This is the point, and it takes work. I'm different than I was 30 years ago. I'm going to tell you what motivated me to change. One thing, love from God for people. All it takes, I remind you, you feel uncomfortable in a group setting? Just look for the person that looks more uncomfortable than you and go visit with them. This is how it works. You don't have to wait in as the great sanguine, the social charismatic of the group. Just go look for somebody to make feel more comfortable and more secure than you do. And along the way, you'll go with them. We are a family, but sometimes we are so loosely connected that we don't like each other before we don't know each other. And I'm afraid this is a problem throughout the layers of our governance Throughout our church, we've gotten a little bit too big. We thought that focusing in things like small groups and taking the time to be connected is wasted. We've got too much to do. We're being pressured by the crowd to get things done. But the truth of the matter is, with the love and the oil of love lubricating the machinery of what our mission is, we'll get a whole lot more done because there'll be a whole lot less evil surmising and doubt and distrust. You won't pluck the cords of my insecurity quite so quickly when you understood where I came from. And you'll show me respect and honor, and I'll do the same for you. Intentionality. Should you be more connected socially? And the last word I want to put on your plate for 2019 is paradoxical. What is a paradox? It's when a surprise comes along, something you didn't anticipate. Now, this story is exceptionally paradoxical. It says in verse 33, she told him the whole truth. Twelve years of bleeding 
A very private experience is public fodder for the whole crowd and for you and me. I highly doubt that half of this congregation would really like their medical journeys to be thrown out for everybody to know about. And the other half probably wouldn't either. Twelve years of the loss of social status, financial status, and physical well-being, it's all splayed for the public. But a 12-year-old's death, which is very public, they're laughing at Jesus when he gets there because he says she's not dead. Her resurrection will be a private experience. What is more paradoxical than that? Nobody knows about the woman's journey, but everybody's going to know. And everybody knows the girl's dead because it just got announced to the crowd. And they laughed and scorned him when he said, she's not dead, she's asleep. But only a very few people are going to be there to see the change. If you don't think that 2019 might not have a few surprises in the journey, you need to stop and accept them. Right from the very beginning, not coveting the stress that they might bring. And it's interesting that the woman who's a social outcast because of the finger of God supposedly is is called daughter and told to be of good courage. And when the man announces in the presence of Jesus that Jairus' daughter has died, Jesus looks at him and says, don't be afraid. In effect, what she's saying is, have the faith of this lady right here. Paradox, you can't make Jesus dirty with your ritual uncleanness, but he can make you clean. Friends, 2018 may have represented a bad journey for you. Things may have happened to you that you never would have wished. Jesus is Lord. I'm not saying every little incidental thing that happens to you is categorically on the, on the layer of, of the same intentional providential provision of Christ, but I do want to say this. There is nothing that's going to come to you in 2019 that is a surprise to God. After you get over being surprised, come back to Jesus and just say, Lord, speak for your servants listening. I'm here before you this morning because in 2019, I I believe God wants to see this church gather in physical presence much more than it ever has before. I believe that many of the social and spiritual and relational ills in the Seventh-day Adventist church could be changed, maybe healed. If we took up the admonition of 2 Chronicles 7.14 and we came and we humbled ourselves and we called on the name of the Lord and we prayed. And by the way, at 3 o'clock this afternoon over at PMC, Pavel Goya, our ministry magazine editor and one of the prayer coordinators for our denomination will be there. I plan to be there. I invite you, those of you who can. If it doesn't uh, alter your, your journey too much, you'll be blessed. And then starting Wednesday night this week will be our 10 days of prayer. 30 minutes of praying, praising, singing. It goes by so fast. And then 30 minutes of reflecting on how to take better care of our body and mind temples. It'll be a fantastic journey. If we need to be intentional, it's now. Don't get used to the fact that the the, uh, fabric of civility is wearing out. There's some threadbare holes. We think everything's just going to go on forever, forever, forever like it is. We should not be afraid because we have Jesus. We should not be afraid because we know there's provision in his presence. We shouldn't be afraid because the prophecy has explained this to us. But friends, if you want to find your social power, you've got to find your social needs met first in Jesus. If you want real intentionality in your life and know which way to go, you've got to prioritize the encounter with Jesus. Your pastors aren't God. Your teachers aren't God. We're just prompters pointing back to the living voice of Jesus. Are you seeking to hear him? Has the priority of knowing him been the intentional uno priority, number one focus of your life? I don't know where I would be if I didn't have Jesus prompting if I couldn't turn to Jesus for healing, if I didn't have him drawing me out of my comfort zones, 
into some of those discomfort zones so other people could be blessed. And have there been surprises on the way? Oh, my. I've been a parent for 28 years, a pastor for about 30, a student of my own life and a student of others. And what my life map looked like 30 years ago and the way it went is very different. But I see the wisdom of God and the provision of God, and I have no regrets, at least not when I was following him. Intentional. Your appointment with Christ day by day. Intentional. You're connecting with other people, which is also social. And ready to let Jesus be Lord no matter which way life turns. Paradoxical. Yeah, there are going to be some surprises. It's okay. Bring them back to Jesus. That's what she was doing. That's what Jairus was doing. Don't let Satan crowd your life from an encounter with Jesus. May God help us all to draw near to him in this new year. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you, friends. Could we let go of some opportunities? Could we let go of some time wasters? so that we could have an emotionally intimate, spiritually connected walk with Jesus and with each other. Don't be too busy. Soon enough, Jesus will appear. And too many things that seemed important will seem trifling then. May God help us all to be intentional, social, and accepting of Christ's Lordship in any of the surprises that are they're paradoxes. We didn't expect them. Why did Jesus make me do this? because he knows best. I'm inviting you to make this journey with me. Seek first the kingdom and trust him on the rest. And that peace passes all, all explanation. And from a secular point of view, all understanding, but it's yours as the precious gift of Christ who knows you personally and is looking to have the same kind of encounter with you that he had with her. May God help us in 2019.
Father, help us to place the cornerstones at the beginning of this new year. The priorities that will become a prime. The adjustments that have to be made around those, Lord, are practical, and you are the God of all efficiency, Lord. You've put the energy in the atom, and the sun is shining today, and all things exist because of your speaking them into existence and your overseeing of them. Our lives can also be fine-tuned. I'm praying, Lord, that everyone listening to me would make the priority of their life connecting with you. This will enlarge their capacity to engage stress and busyness. It will give them a calmer and broader mind, a sweeter temperament, an ability, Lord, uh, to do the things that you're prompting and, and not be prematurely exhausted or, or mentally worn out because they've just gone farther than they should without purpose. I'm praying, Lord, bless the husbands and the wives. May they have the dialogues, especially if they have children in their home. May family worship not be hit or miss, but may it be the beautiful, sweet communion of the morning and the sweet, innocent calmness of the night. I'm praying, Lord, for our world church and every level underneath it, and I'm praying for this village church, Lord. May we keep pressing together. May we engage each other, pray for each other, and may the sweetness we take away from these encounters give us the strength to go face the stresses. Thank you, Lord, for another year. Thank you for Jesus, who said, I'm not too busy to have this conversation, <laughs> and then went on to bring a dead girl back to life. Lord, you're not too busy for us. You'll listen. I pray help us too. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.